Uh, this morning, uh, we are going to continue uh, the conversation that will carry us from now until the holidays, uh, the teaching series that uh, we have been calling The Non-Essential Way, an invitation into the possibility of the moment. The Non-Essential Way, an invitation into the possibility of the moment. Two weeks ago, we talked about hope. Last week, we talked about the mind and the invitation to change our minds, to change how and what we think, uh, to have the mind of Christ, to have a mind that might be able to transcend the divided two-column thinking that has created the lives and the world uh, that most of us are inhabiting these days. Uh, and I'm hoping this morning that uh, we will we'll tie both of these themes together in some way and also uh, push a little bit further. So uh, a few weeks ago, I was in a uh, Zoom meeting, uh, sort of like this one. Um, I was uh, talking with some friends from around the country, um, and we were actually practicing uh, the way of the circle together. Um, this is actually a group of people that I first, uh, th this is the group of people that I was with when I first experienced uh, the practice of the way of the circle. Um, I was with them about three years ago uh, when I began as a student at the Living School for Action and Contemplation. And uh, I'm in my basement. It's, I think, a Tuesday evening at like 9 p.m. Um, we're sort of doing a check-in on how we're all doing. And uh, my friend James was a part of the conversation. Uh, James is in his mid-30s. He has three young children. Um, he's done everything from drive cabs in New York City to work in a laboratory at an oil, oil refinery to play music um, and uh, lead practices at his church. Um, he is one of the uh, most talented and um, funniest uh, humans I've ever met. Um, and James lives in Lake Charles, Louisiana. And that night he had just evacuated his family um, several hours away to Baton Rouge because uh, Hurricane Laura was beginning to make landfall. And as the storm progressed and forecast changed, um, very last minute, uh, they were evacuating because it was now possible that his home was gonna be flooded by a six to 10 foot storm surge. Um, and he was really emotional. They had just um, evacuated that day. Um, and it was such an emotional thing to hear him describing what it was like to pack what they could on short notice, um, what it was like to try and cram everything in their storage shed so it wouldn't blow away or maybe be washed away in a storm surge and cause damage to their property or other people's properties. Um, and he was honest about the struggle um, that he had with extended family and neighbors who were unwilling to leave, um, who were unwilling to, to evacuate and sort of like the, the devastating fear that um, he was feeling on their behalf. Um, but after sharing, um, so vulnerably about the chaos that he and his family had been experiencing. Um, he sort of shifted to what I would say was maybe like a different gear of emotional intensity. And as he was talking, he was sort of like looking all over the place as he was telling these stories, but he shifted to a different gear and he sort of looked right at um, the camera. I mean, it looked like he was looking right at us. And he just said, it's all an effing miracle all of it. This moment is all we have. All we have is this breath, man. That's it. And it's all an effing miracle. Of course, I'm censoring. He wasn't, he didn't say effing. Um, it's all an effing miracle. All of it. This moment is all we have. All we have is this breath, man. That's it. And it's all an effing miracle. He said that several times. And of course, at this point, the rest of us um, in the group, like we all have tears running down our faces and we're just stunned. Um, I just remember feeling like deep in my bones, like how does somebody speak with such clarity and resolve while going through something like this? And, you know, sure, we could make the case that you know, he was in the, in the middle of experiencing multiple traumas and his emotions and nervous system were for sure short-circuiting as they would be with any of us. 
but he was speaking with decisiveness and confidence as he said that. Um, these, he said these words in a very grounded way, like somebody who was awake. It was as if the sort of the enormousness of the crisis of the moment and the immensity of everything that he should have been worried about and afraid of, like all of it was all so much that he was actually able to just sort of let it all go. And in that moment, his vision and his attention were undivided. And because of this, he was like alive in the actual moment he was experiencing. He was alive to the only thing that's actually real, to the only thing that's actually essential, which is right now. He was experiencing what spiritual wisdom across, across multiple traditions teaches us that right now, this moment, this breath is the only thing that is essential because it is the only thing that is actually real. And in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus begins his teachings by saying, a more loving world is at hand. Change your mind. And of course, Jesus says plenty about what this declaration might look like in practice. Um, Plenty of instructions about how to try to work this out in our lives. Plenty of stories to try and disrupt our limited imaginations for what life in this world could look like. And there's no shortage of things to grab onto about how Jesus invites us to work this out. But there's a few really important foundational aspects to this sort of life in this sort of world that Jesus is pointing to. Jesus says things like, whoever has eyes to see, let them see. Jesus somehow indicates that this invitation to a more loving world is somehow about seeing in a new way, in a different way. Jesus also says things like, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Bring me a child. And I don't think Jesus is like assuming that the people he was talking to had never seen a bird or a flower or a child before. And I don't think uh, he was doing this because he needed some sort of like object lesson to create a teachable moment, you know, like youth pastor Jesus that he was trying to, to make right there. I think part of what he's getting at when he says things like, hey, whoever's eyes to see, let them see. Hey, look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Bring me a child. I think part of what he's getting at is that if you haven't ever looked at a bird, like really, like seen it, like been present with it, like if you haven't really looked at a flower, like really, like seen it, been present with it, if you haven't actually like allowed yourself to be present with a child and like really seen them, like really, if you you haven't done that, it's going to be really hard for you to get the rest of this stuff that I'm talking about. Like you might understand it in part, but it's going to be really hard for you to work out beyond just ideas. And then, of course, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of its own. He's not saying, let's all sort of like live recklessly without a care in the world. Let's be irresponsible. Um, He's not saying don't be wise. He's saying pay attention to the only thing that is real and essential. Tomorrow doesn't exist yesterday doesn't exist, at least not in the ways we have convinced ourselves that they exist in some sort of linear cause and effect scientific way. I think Cliff did such a beautiful job in our practice this morning of inviting us to recognize that time actually collapses in on itself when we can become aware of it. But tomorrow doesn't exist. Yesterday doesn't exist in the ways that we often think that it does, that the only thing that is real is and that is essential is right now. Jesus is saying to them, learn to pay attention to right now. This moment is all that is real. So last week we talked about the invitation to change our minds to change 
how and what we think as a way of participating in and helping to bring about a more loving world. And we talked about how for many of us, the two column way of thinking is the default way of thinking about things and operating. Um, a divided way of thinking that has led ultimately to a divided life and a divided world. And we talked about this invitation into a, a third way of thinking or a different way of thinking or a new kind of consciousness. And I know that last week was really heavy on concept in theory, though I tried as best as I could to sort of help make it as practical as it could be. But to push all of that a little bit further today, I think part of what my friend James was experiencing and what Jesus is getting at uh, with this reality of being able to be awake to the only thing that is real, to the only thing that is essential right now, this moment, this breath, this flower, this bird, this child, today, like that reality is part of how we learn a new and more loving way of being in the world. It is learning to live with undivided attention. It's learning to live with attention that isn't too column. Because if we can learn to experience a moment in an undivided way, then we might begin to see everyone and everything in an undivided way. If we can experience a moment that isn't being sliced into columns in our minds, um, then we might be able to experience people, arguments, perspectives, cultures in a way that isn't being sliced into all of these different columns in our mind. What I'm saying is that learning to look at a flower is how we might begin to resolve the tension of every dualistic, binary, two-column way of thinking and living that exists in our world. Learning to say, even in the midst of extreme despair and trauma, learning to say it's all an effing miracle, all of it, this moment is all we have. All we have is this breath. That's it. It's all an effing miracle. Learning to say that, to be able to see that and feel that in our bodies is a starting place for moving beyond Trump versus Biden, red versus blue, in versus out, right versus wrong, or whatever your two columns might be right now. And even more plainly, I wonder how on earth uh, we might be able to experience the possibility of the moment if we cannot even behold the moment. Or how on earth we can bring any sort of reconciliation or wholeness to our lives and to the world if we cannot see in any sort of reconciled and whole way. I think there's a lot of really well-intentioned, good people right now who are unable to see the pain and suffering that exists in our world because they just cannot see beyond the columns and categories that they've been given. And there are a lot of people in the world, good people, well-intentioned people in the world right now who think they're solving the pain and suffering of the world, but in doing so, they're just reorganizing the columns into division because they still can't see in some sort of undivided whole way. A few weeks ago, uh, it was 7 a.m. Uh, I had just gotten dressed, I'd made myself a nice pour over coffee. My phone was already buzzing um, with some notifications and messages. I had several unfinished conversations from the evening before that were spilling into the morning. Uh, my mind was already beginning to prep for meetings I had later in the day. Uh, and my nine-year-old son Zeke uh, had gotten up out of bed and I asked him uh, what he wanted for breakfast and he didn't answer. And then, um, I asked him to get dressed. I said, all right, well, we can eat in a few minutes. Why don't you go get dressed right now? Get ready. Let's start getting ready for school. And he didn't listen. And uh, he went in another room for a minute. And then he came back into the kitchen and he said, Daddy, can we just snuggle on the couch for a minute? And it's one of those moments where we can think like a thousand different things all at once, right? It's, it's a miracle. Um, how much we're all, we're all able to process instantaneously because my immediate response was no, because 
my phone, my delicious coffee getting cold, the conversations I need to resolve. We need to eat breakfast. We need to get dressed. And like, it's a miracle that sometimes we get to school on time. Um, and this little snuggling detour is not going to help us get to that finish line. Um, but I said, sure. And while I was on uh, the couch with Zeke in our front room, my mind is swirling. Phone, coffee, conversation, breakfast, clothes, school, my agenda for the day, phone, coffee, conversation, coffee, breakfast, coffee, agenda for the day, coffee. And after three or four minutes of um, being with Zeke, I just sort of like snapped out of it. I sort of woke up and I realized that though I had been with Zeke for three or four minutes, I hadn't actually been with Zeke at all. I was there, but I wasn't there. I was everywhere else. And in that moment, I realized that I couldn't remember the last time that I had really given him undivided attention. I spend a lot of time with him and we've spent a lot of time together the past six months, but I couldn't remember the last time I had really been present with him. I couldn't remember the last time I had really seen him. I couldn't remember the last time that I had felt like I had really experienced an actual moment with him. Now, life is really challenging right now, and it's busy, and there's no sense in shaming myself over this or shaming you over what is likely a really similar reality in your life. But where we're, but where are we living? Like, where are we living if we're not actually living in the moment? We're not living anywhere. And for many of us, when we think we're with the most important people in our lives, or when we think we're doing the most important work in our lives, or when we're so certain in our perspectives about something or about our argument or about something we have strong convictions about, when, we, when we're doing all that, we're actually absent. We're actually not even there because our attention and our perspective is so divided. Our vision is divided. The presence we actually bring in these situations often is absence because it's not whole, because we're not whole in those moments. So where do we go from here with that, with that reality for many of us? Really practically, maybe it is just saying, I need a slower walk. Uh, I need to try to figure out how to build a bubble around some actual space with my kids. Like really look at them, look at their eyes when they're talking to me. Maybe it's cleaning up our calendars a little bit, like canceling some things. Maybe it's turning off our phones more often. Maybe it's canceling Hulu once you've finished Last Man on Earth, hypothetically. There's these sorts of things and they're necessary and they're practical and they're important. Those, those sort of like ways of modifying our behavior. Uh, but we also have to pursue more than those sort of practical tips and tricks for life management. Because there's also the work of trying to cultivate this way of being and seeing in the world so that we don't have to wait for a hurricane and an evacuation or we don't have to wait for the beautiful morning voice of a nine-year-old to peel it all back for us. It might be forcing yourself uh, to look at a flower for an uncomfortably long amount of time. It may be a breathing exercise or a breathwork practice or going through the practice that Cliff led us in this morning several times this week. It may be getting back on that meditation pillow. It may be returning to a specific prayer practice that you just haven't had time for as of late. Not because any of that is where the magic is, right? Um, but because if we can see it there in those moments, if we can learn it in those very small intentional ways, then we might learn to see it and experience it everywhere. I'm convinced that to try and survive the madness of the world we're living in right now and beyond survival to try and help bring about a more loving world in the midst of all of this madness, we have to do whatever it takes to pull ourselves back to reality, to the only thing that is real, to the only thing that is essential in the universe, 
this moment right now. The 20th century Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh says, because you are alive, everything is possible. Because you are alive, everything is possible. Every moment is loaded with possibility and we can live with hope because we are alive right now. And it's a effing miracle. Every single breath.